Welcome to this workshop on integrated pest management for the Modern Gardener Part 1, presented by our Master Gardener of Nevada County. Here is our presenter, Bonnie Brott. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, for those of you who might have been here last week, this is part two for of this talk. And last week we covered some of the things that you can see here on the picture. We covered the basic history of pest management and the some of the things that have happened in the recent past to bring us to where we are today. We talked a lot last week about cultural controls and how you can help your plants grow to be healthy, which will help them to resist pests. Now, I will repeat something that I mentioned last week, and that is the definition of IPM. A lot of people don't know exactly what that means, but it's integrated pest management. It came into existence as a concept back in the 1960s and 70s as we moved out of the pesticide age, although technically I guess we're still sort of in it, but a lot of people are trying to do better. It is an ecosystem-based strategy, which basically means it takes into account everything, all the creatures and plants in the area in which you're working. And it focuses on long-term prevention of pests or the pest damage through a combination of techniques, not just one, not just spray everything in sight, but a combination of techniques, hopefully that will all work together. Uh, pest control materials and methods are selected, they're applied, hopefully <clears throat> in a manner that minimizes all the risks. Well, no, not all the risks, but as many as possible to humans, to pets, grandchildren, etc., to beneficial insects and non-target organisms like the fish in the creeks and the birds and etc., et and the environment in general. So today we're going to continue the story that we started last week with cultural controls. And this week we're going to have two of the remaining best groups of techniques to include in the IPM program that we hope you all might begin in your gardens. And first we will have mechanical controls. That'll start out with the physical barriers, physical or preventative barriers to prevent the insect pests from getting to your crops. Water stream washing, which is very well known, but it's a little more difficult than it seems traps, of which there are a lot of different kinds, and hand picking, which is one of the master gardener favorite methods, but <laughs> it's a little hard to get over some of that. Can I touch that hornworm with my hand thing? Well, we'll talk about that. So we will start out now with the IPM mechanical controls of barriers. Now you can see here a selection of different types of barriers and there are lots of them. But in the upper left, we have here the, the, the row covers, which is, a, it has a lot of different uses. A very lightweight row cover, which a lot of people use Agrabon, which is a very famous one. Of Agrabon 15, one of the lowest numbers that you can get is very lightweight, it doesn't really protect your plants from heat or cold, but it does pre prevent them from insects. If you cover the row all the way to the ground, um, all the way from one side to the other, and then sort of anchor it down on the bottom as best you can with a rocks or a layer of sand or dirt holding the edges down, you will very effectively prevent insect pests from being able to enter. It is very useful, especially at the beginning of the season. As you can see, towards the end of the season or towards later on in the summer, your plants are gonna be too big to protect in this manner, unless you continue to put larger and larger hoops over those plants. 
But the earlier the plants are in the summer, the more susceptible they are to some of these pests. So the early protection is often the best. Down here on the bottom, I have a, a picture which technically doesn't fall into uh, insect protection, but what you can do with a raised bed is you can put this chicken wire cover over small plants at the beginning to protect them from rabbits and other squirrels and, and things that are going to nibble at your tiny little plants just when they're getting started. Then as the plants get a little bigger, you will remove this. The rabbits may still be there, but at least they won't be getting the baby plants, which are again, some of the most susceptible. I'll then move over to this big picture in the middle, which many of you may know is tangle foot applied to the, to the trunk of a tree. Now, you don't want to apply the tangle foot, which is a sticky substance that you can buy at almost any of the local nurseries, but you don't want to apply it directly to the bark because that stuff can do damage to the bark and it's almost impossible. Well, no, it is impossible to get it off the bark once you've gotten it there. So usually you wrap it up with something in this case, it's almost, it looks almost like surgical gauze, but it could be paper, cardboard. Um, I used to use strips of towels, the old towels that I no longer needed. And they have um, a, surf, a, you know, a, a consistency that allows you to wrap them fairly tightly around the tree so that insects don't really crawl under them and then coat the outside of them with the tangle foot. So this will help to prevent ants, for instance, from crawling up the tree and carrying their little aphid uh, passengers with them to infect whatever is at the top of the tree, apples, peaches, etc. And it also helps to prevent codling moth from crawling up the tree at the beginning of the season from where they have been overwintering in the soil. So every little thing you can do to stop coddling moths is worth doing, and this is one of them. Then at the end of the season, you remove this whole covering and start again next time so that you don't damage the bark of the tree. Over here on the right are barriers against cutworms. Up in the upper part, you can see it's just a simple paper cup. I believe this is a, either a plastic or a wax covered paper cup. And you cut the bottom out of it and you stick it into the soil at least an inch down below the surface and a, an inch or maybe two and an inch or two above the surface. Cut worms live in the soil. They attack small seedlings. And you can go to bed one night having looked at your beautiful little tomato seedling, and the next morning it will be laying on the ground dead. So it's really important to try to help protect your tiny seedlings from cutworms. They don't tend to uh, attack larger seedlings or larger plants. So once the plant gets bigger, you can remove these collars and they should be Okay, they, they live in the soil and they travel right below the surface. So that's why an inch or two down and an inch or two up should protect them. Down on the bottom, you have the same thing, but it's actually, uh, as you can see, um, a, a can that had the bottom cut out of it and stuck into the ground. And the good thing about having this metal can is that you can paint the outside of it with glue or other sticky substance and you can, sorry, you can coat it with sand and you will also then prevent slugs and snails from crawling up the sides of the can to get to your plants because they do not like that surface. Okay, so we'll move on now to the next, which is very famous, water stream washing. I have a couple pictures here of hoses that have been used for this purpose. And what you can see is that you need a very sort of small, fine, strong stream to wash 
aphids, for example, off of the plants. This is a common practice when trying to control aphids without pesticides. And aphids tend to sit there on the plants with their little mouth parts jammed to the surface of the plant. And so they are actually stuck there pretty tightly. You need a, a pretty strong blast of water to get them off of there, which is why I am trying to show you this. These streams of water need to be sort of tiny and strong. Be careful that you don't blast the plant itself because you can do damage, especially if your stream of water is too strong. But you can experiment around with it with different heads and see that you get the best you can. Now, the second thing about this is that this is not going to work all in one day. You have to continue to do this day after day, or at least every couple days, because the aphids themselves will be washed down onto the soil beneath the plant, but you're not killing them. You're washing them down, but they will be back because they're just laying down there, recovering from the shock, and then they wake up and come right back up again. So what I have often done is to blast the aphids off the, on the plant, and then as they are laying on the soil, I can spray them with a dilute solution of the insecticidal soap, which is very non-toxic, and direct it right at them. So I'm only killing them, not everything else. For example, right here on the top of this plant, you can see this little ladybug getting ready to eat all of these aphids. So when you wash them away, maybe try not to wash her away or leave a few for her to eat because I'm betting you'll find that she's gonna be there on your plants too. So now we'll move on to the next one, the next area of this, which is traps. And oh my gosh, there are so many of them. If you go into any of the nurseries, any of the big box stores in their garden department, there are so many choices, so many that I can't keep up with them from the one time when I give this talk to the next time. But I'll give you some of my favorites. Up in the upper left, that yellow sheet is the yellow sticky trap. It doesn't have pheromone, it doesn't have a lure, it's just sticky. But what attracts the insects is the yellow. They are somehow attracted to the yellow color and once they get stuck, they are there forever. Now, what you can see all over that yellow trap are called fungus gnats. And that particular uh, um, yellow sticky trap was in my greenhouse. Fungus gnats are very common in a greenhouse because they come as passengers in every single bag of potting soil that you buy. If you use that outside, then you usually don't notice them because they fly away, disappear, uh, other things eat them, etc. But in a greenhouse, they can be very annoying. So a couple of those yellow sticky traps that you see right there in my greenhouse takes care of the problem. As, as you can see. Down on the bottom is another kind of trap, and that's a pretty famous. It's a beer trap. You can put it out in a little pie pan like that right there and attract slugs and snails into the beer trap, usually overnight, but they certainly do it. So one thing you have to be careful of is don't let the dog or the cat get into the beer. That's a problem. Up on the upper right is a codling moth trap. It's also a sticky trap, but it does have a lure which attracts male codling moths. And so most of these traps are designed to monitor pest populations, not so much to reduce pest populations, but depending on how many trees you have, it can make a bit of a difference, but that's one other kind of trap that you would hang in the tree. Down on the bottom right, you have uh, traps that you can put in your pantry to uh, attract pantry moths, 
um, the little kinds of beetles that infest grain products, et cetera. And it's very helpful to have a couple of those hanging around in your pantry during the summer. And then we have that, which is one of my favorite traps. It's, it's a wasp trap. That particular variety is called a rescue trap and it's very efficient. Now, what you see right there is actually horrific. And it was, it, that's my yard and that's, those are my traps. And I did that about six years ago when my son told me that he was gonna get married and they wanted to have a party in our backyard. And I knew just how many wasps there were in my backyard. So I started trapping very early and look what I got. There were Ziploc bags full of trapped wasps by the time I got finished and the party went off without a hitch, but I would never trap to that extent again. I had people in the group that were allergic to wasps and so I needed to do the best I could as far as control, but I had no idea how many wasp nests there were in my yard. And ever since then, I have never trapped that many. So I might've actually reduced the population quite a little that one summer. But that, those particular traps, they do come with a lure, which brings in only one kind of wasp. And that kind of wasp is the one that has the gruesome nickname of meat bee, where they come to your picnic and land all over your hamburgers, et cetera. That's the kind of wasp that you will trap with this particular type of traps. This, that's the Vespid wasps. You will not trap paper wasps. You will not trap hornets. So one kind of wasp, it just happens that they are very numerous in this county. So if you have someone in your family who is allergic or you have a real problem, you can use these traps in general wasps are very good guys. They are predators. They are pollinators. They are not really worth wiping out every single wasp in the county. So only use these if you have a real problem. The next type of traps that I will talk about are called light traps. And they are fascinating to use. Now, I hate slides that have lots and lots of words on them, but so you don't really have to read those, but they are uh, traps where you have a light and a funnel and a container at the bottom for holding the insects attracted by the light, which then fall into the funnel and work their way down into the bottom. And the usual kind of lights used are black lights that are incredibly able to tr attract insects at night. They are, Black lights are especially useful in situations where there are street lights or house lights or whatever that are competing with the light traps because black lights attract more insects. Although even a regular light, as you can tell from looking at your porch light at night, even a regular light will at attract insects. Now, a second slide on light traps tells you a little bit about how they're made. Very simple, light on the top, funnel beneath, and a round can below that. Now, in general, it's a really good idea to put something, you need to put something in that lower container, the can, water in particular for the insects to fall in. Better to have even some soap or bleach in the water to help them on to be killed because that is, a, it's an extremely effective way to catch hundreds, if not even thousands of insects in a night. Now, the thing about light traps is that they are only good for the control of nocturnal insects. Of course, moths, which is one of your main pest problems, are nocturnal insects. So that's, that's a good thing. Light traps are somewhat indiscriminate and they will also attract beneficials, but many of the beneficials don't fly at night. So hopefully that will minimize your non-target damage. Okay, 
The next slide we have is the last of our mechanical controls, and that is hand picking. It is as gruesome as this sounds, it's a very efficient way of controlling insects that are slow enough to catch so that they aren't going to fly away the minute you look at them, large enough to grab and won't sting or bite you. And those most any insect that falls into that category can be hand picked. Uh, just pick them off, toss them in a container with bleach or soap and water, and that I promise that will help. Now this one, this guy in the middle right here, is picking them off. These are striped cucumber beetles and putting them in his other hand, which you certainly can do, or you can just drop them right into the container. If it's just too much to imagine going in and doing this with your hands, then just use gloves, either your garden gloves or the plastic or latex or nitrile uh, surgical gloves that you can buy at hardware store or pretty much any store. And that will help you, uh, especially whether or not it's just simply that you think it's too yucky to touch, which I can understand, or if you happen to come across some caterpillars in particular with the urticating hairs on the outside of them that are very um, painful to come in contact with. So this will help protect you from that too. We have up here on the top, the spotted cucumber beetle, upper left. Down below him is the very famous and well-known tomato hornworm, which are always big enough to grab and slow enough to not be able to escape you and they won't sting or bite, so grab them, definitely grab them, get them off of there. Down here below on the bottom, this pretty little red and black guy is a harlequin bug, and they are very common pests on cabbage and other whole crops, so you do need to reduce that population as well as you can. In the middle, you have, on the bottom, you have a cabbage looper, named for the way that they they move and he is also a very nasty pest of cabbage and can decimate those crops so you can pick him off and picking picking them off is a very specific and targeted approach to pest control because you're not hurting anything else down here in the lower right is a very famous uh, pest for the master gardeners anyway. This is a scarab beetle known as a hoplia beetle. They're only about half an inch, maybe three quarters of an inch long if you take the legs into account. And they, um, they love light colored flowers, roses and irises. They, they, you almost never find them on the dark colored flowers, dark red, dark purple. It, they just prefer white or yellow. So that's where you're going to find them and they do a lot of damage. And they are very slow and clumsy and very easy for you to catch. So that they're a good candidate for this. Don't bother with this one up on the top. You know her. She's not going to be the one you want to pick by hand. That's, that's not good. Okay, now the story continues and we move into my favorite area of IPM, which is biological controls. And that means the ability to allow the naturally occurring insect predators or other types of predators to control the insects for you without your help. They don't need your help. They're pretty good, except for not to spray them with pesticides, but they're pretty good at their job and you certainly don't want to inherit their job. So best to let them do their job. Now I'm gonna go through and just have a little discussion on some of these. I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with, for example, mantids, the praying mantis that you find on your rose bush or probably the same rose bush uh, outside your kitchen door or whatever, because they, they tend to be territorial and stay in one place for a while, but they're easy to recognize and they're great predators. The only problem with them is they eat everything, including bees and ladybugs and anything else that wanders by. 
So I do not believe I would import them into my yard. I would encourage them to be to be there. I wouldn't kill them, but they are not going to be your pest control solution. They're very interesting and they're easy to recognize. Down here is dragonflies. They're also easy to recognize. Probably you might not find them commonly in your yard if you don't have a water feature or a pond or something like that nearby because that's where they tend to hang out. But they're excellent mosquito predators and other small flying insects. So we do want to encourage them. They're great. Now, as far as these other things go, I am going to talk about each one of them and just tell you a little bit about some of their characteristics, what you need to know. The first one I'll use are the surfid flies or hoverflies, referring to the way that they fly, which is like tiny little helicopters buzzing in one spot and then zooming to another spot and buzzing there. They're, they are very good little pollinators. They will pollinate a great many of the flowers on your apple trees, cherry trees, peach trees. And they are very similar looking to a wasp. They're wasp mimics, but they only have two wings where a wasp has four. Uh, that's a little hard to see because they never stand still. So you're not gonna be able to count the wings. But that is one thing that you would notice if you put them under a microscope. Now up here on the upper right is, an, is a larva of a surfed fly and they are wonderful predators of small pest insects like aphids and scale and mealybugs. And the, and the other thing is that the, those larvae look like the larva of everything else. How many little green worms are the larva of pest insects? So it's really hard for you to be able to tell them apart from the pests. When you see green worms, be a little careful of what you might want to spray because you don't want to kill these guys. They are pointed at the back end and rounded at the front end. So that might be a little bit of a clue. And some of them have the white stripe up the back, but it's difficult to identify the larva of the surfing flies. They are one of the earliest or earliest emerging of the springtime predators. They are definitely out now. And so that's one reason why I put them first. They're one of the main reasons why when you see the first aphids in the spring, you don't want to kill them all because when these guys come out from their winter hibernation, they're gonna need aphids to eat. They're gonna need a food source or they're gonna move on to your neighbor's yard or starve. So let's give them a little bit of food to, to keep them in your garden. They are not available commercially, so you're not going to be importing them into the garden, but keep an eye out for them because here in the foothills, they're everywhere. The next slide shows one of the smallest little predatory insects that you might not even see. You, you might never know that they're there. Minute pirate bugs. There's two different kinds in general. One on the top here is a little larger, Anthochorus, and this one is Aureus, the smaller one. They're very tiny, less than a quarter of an inch long. And they, um, so they're not gonna be where you can see them and they're not in huge numbers, but they are wonderful predators and they feed on uh, mites and thrips and aphids and very, very good at feeding on eggs of other insects. Now, these guys appear later in the summer. So while the surfed flies are flying early, plus some of the other things I'm gonna show you, these guys are later. So it's sort of nice. They have a continuum of protection in your garden, but they do and can inflict a, a painful bite. I sort of am showing you pictures here of where they have done so. They don't have venom, they aren't poisonous, but, but it's, it hurts. So they are available for purchase commercially, but most gardeners don't do that. They don't bring them in, they don't, need or want any more than are already there. 
Okay, now we have one of the most beautiful little insect predators that there are. This was one of my projects when I was in school studying entomology back in the day. These are green lace wings and they are gorgeous. They're, they have beautiful, pretty lacy wings and golden copper colored eyes. If you ever get to look at them up close, and they um, and long antenna, and they are attracted to lights. You can see them flittering around lights at night and in your garden during the day. She lays her eggs on a long silk stalk that holds them up in the air. And that actually does protect them from marauding ants, for example, that will be crawling back and forth below them and not even realize that there's a yummy meal right above their heads. It's a pretty good idea on the part of the mama. These, these creatures are available co commercially. You can bring them in. I'm going to show you a little bit later some of the things you might watch out for when you bring them in, but they definitely can be purchased and imported. Now, the larva up here on the right is just like a mini tank or a little alligator and he's got great big jaws. You can see right here, he's munching on an aphid and they munch on aphids all day long. They are wonderful predators. They will eat aphids and scale and mealybugs and any kind of little pests that are hanging around. These guys, of course, don't fly, they just crawl, but they turn into this eventually. And uh, one thing to remember is they can nip you with those mouth parts. So just be a little careful. Don't handle them a lot, but don't kill them either because they are great to have around. Now the next category is the predator beetles. Predaceous beetles, ground beetles, usually a minim, a medium to large, size so you can see them pretty well. On the, I'm going to start with this guy on the right. This guy on the right is a soldier beetle and they are very, very common in the springtime and early summer here in Nevada County or well into the summer. And they're almost always characterized by long slim body and black and red coloring. It's sometimes red here, black here, uh, red and black markings on the back, but red and black long and slim, and that's soldier beetles. And they're great at eating aphids. And so you don't want to uh, get rid of them either. And don't worry if you see them. This guy here on the left is one of the prettiest of the ground beetles. That's a tiger beetle, very long legs. So he can run very fast. He's a great ant predator because he's uh, hunting on the ground and his larva bury themselves under the ground and they catch ants as they walk by. So all the life stages are working to help uh, get rid of insect pests that you may not want. They um, feed on soil dwelling insect larvae, even below the soil, um, pupa, snails, slugs, and sometimes on organic plant litter or seeds, but mostly they are looking for insects. And these are not commercially available. So encourage the ones you've got. We have now parasitic wasps. And the adults of these wasps, which you can see up here on the upper left, are very tiny. Uh, sorry, it keeps changing on its own. They are very tiny, so you may not even know that they're there. They fly around, they're so small, a uh, stinger that they have is almost always unable to penetrate the skin of a human. They can penetrate an egg of an aphid or even sometimes the body of an aphid, but they, they, they are, they're nothing that you need to worry about or be afraid of. They generally speaking lay their eggs in other eggs, other insect eggs, and they can also lay eggs within an insect host. And the larva inside will feed on the host or the egg and they kill them sort of from the inside out. 
you can see on the bottom an aphid mummy, they call them mummy, with a big hole in the back. That is the exit hole where the baby wasp worked its way out from the inside where it killed its aphid host. These little parasitic wasps are an incredible help in your garden. They, the uh, wasps, the uh, adult wasps feed on flowers, nectar and pollen. And so you do wanna have that kind of flowers for them, those floral resources for them to eat to encourage them. You may never see them or you may hardly ever see them, but they're very important. So keep an eye out for them and give them what they need in order to stay. There are many species of these and they are available commercially. They've been studied for quite a long number of years in uh, working in greenhouses or even large or orchards for control of specific pests. So more so than for the home gardener, but you can certainly use them depending on the size of your garden. Okay. Here is one of our favorites. So we have lady beetles, better known as ladybugs, the only bug that almost no kid is scared of. They will hold them and let them crawl on them. And that's great because there's no need to be afraid of most bugs. And it's sort of nice that these guys are good representatives of the species. They can reproduce quickly, laying yellow groups of eggs on the undersides of leaves in your garden in response to pest populations that may be going up. And the larva, which you can see up here on the right and over here on the left, you can, they are again, almost like little alligators with long, strong jaws that they can use for biting but they're incredibly good predators. And when you see those guys, many people don't know what those are. When they, so it's sort of unnerving when you see them on your, the leaves of your plants. So you don't, don't kill them. Don't worry about what they are. Don't pick them up, but they are good guys. So leave them. That's one thing I want you to remember. If you don't remember anything about this talk, remember what the baby lady beetles look like. And they, and they can bite, so just sort of steer clear of them a little bit. They are certainly, as you know, available for purchase, but you need to have a few things to beware of, and I will discuss that in just a minute. Okay, so beneficial insects, where can I get them? Well, the pretty simple answer is you really don't need to get them. You probably already have them. They're everywhere here in the foothills and you don't need to buy them. Certainly you can, some of them at least, but they will come to your garden. I, I guarantee that they will visit, but if your garden is established, if it's been there for a while, then of course they're already there, but whether they decide to stay is up to you. You can make life easy and happy for them and they will stay. You can spray them with pesticides and they will die or at least they will leave. They need food, they need shelter, a place to reproduce, lay their eggs, have their babies grow up and safety from the pesticides. So that's what you need to provide for them for, to keep them in your garden. And if you can do that, then they will stay. How to attract them by habitat manipulation. You first, 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 have to learn to tolerate low populations of pests or the plant feeding insects because they are food. They are the food source for the predators, for the natural enemies. And remember, the pests wake up first in the spring. The pests arrive first. That's sort of nature's plan because after all, they are eating the plants and the predators are eating them. So the pests have to be there first for the predators to have a food source. So secondly, you need to avoid cultural practices, which will cause sudden explosions in numbers of the pest species. For example, over-fertilization with nitrogen. 
that will cause your plants to have a wild spurt of growth of brand new, yummy, delicious little new leaves, which the pests will flock to and increase in numbers greatly. And often the predators can't keep up. The predators are, are keep trying to uh, respond to changes in pest populations by increasing their numbers or decreasing their numbers, but they can't keep up with huge, fast increases of pest populations. So give them a break and don't over fertilize your plants, thereby causing a massive explosion of aphids or whatever else happens to be there. And pesticide use does the same thing because if you spray a plant with pesticides and basically kill everything in sight, the first thing that's gonna come back is the pest. Later on, the predators may catch up, but in the meantime, the pests may have done an overwhelming amount of damage. And that's because there weren't any predators there to help you out by controlling them. So that probably means you're gonna have to spray again and again. And that's how people get into the spray pesticide trap over and over again. Now you also need to plant a variety of sequentially flowering plants to give them, to give the beneficials of food source, nectar, pollen, shelter, and don't forget the grasses because even though they don't have nectar, they have a great deal of pollen. So that's great. And they are, the beneficials can shelter in there too. Sequentially flowering means throughout the seasons. Now we may not be able to do that up here in the winter, but at least three seasons. So that would be great. Here's some suggestions as far as plants that you might include in your landscape where and when you can. Um, first of all and foremost, consider the California native plants. They are programmed as it were <clears throat> to give excellent food sources to insects that live here also and California native insects. So here are some of the best ones that we can think of. The penstemon, foothill penstemon, the ceanothus, which are huge, gorgeous plants. They're a little tricky to grow because they hate water in the summer. So don't put them in a place where they're gonna get a lot of water or they will die, like a lot of native plants. Um, on the lower left, we have manzanita, which pretty much everyone knows what they are. They have beautiful, this is a sort of a little inclusion of a little picture up here on the upper left, beautiful little bell-shaped pink flowers. This is my yard. This is my manzanita plant. And literally when those flowers are there, that plant is covered with native bees and flies and all the kinds of the serpent flies and all that kinds of, of plant, the insects that you want insect you are trying to attract. You have the Sierra Lupin, which is a beautiful plant. And over here up on the bottom, we have the white native yarrow. And there are many different colors of yarrow. You can get different hybrids and they all do a pretty good job of attracting beneficials. Now we have some more California native plants. We have blue-eyed grass up on the upper left which is a great pollinator and beneficial plant. We have California buckwheat, which if you ever have grown it or walked past it, it's alive with buzzing because the insects love it. They love it. So it's a great plant to plant if you can. Down on the bottom, we have two very large members of the native plant group. On the lower left, we have California flannel bush or Fremontodendron. <laughs> it, it comes in general in the normal size plant will grow very large, 15, 20 feet sometimes when it's mature, across and tall. So you have to find just the right spot for it. But when that plant is flowering with the little yellow flowers that you see on it right there, the bees are everywhere, especially the native bees, which is a wonderful thing to be able to attract. So Fremontodendron is something to consider. 
And on the lower right is the Matilaha poppy, which is also a very large plant. Once it becomes established and it produces absolutely huge flowers. These are called, this is a nickname is the fried eggplant because these flowers are very large and round and white with that great big yellow ball in the middle. And oh my, the every kind of insect in the world is attracted to these flowers. Now, again, these plants can grow, say maybe five feet tall, at least, maybe a little taller, but they spread under the ground. And so wherever you plant them, there will be others gr eventually growing around them. So you will have end up with a nice stand of them. So again, choose your spot so that it's not crawling all over your raised beds or your house. Keep them maybe away from, from the house. Unlike this person right here who planted the flannel bush right next to the house, that was probably not a good idea. But they're, they're great pollinator and uh, beneficial insect attracting plants. But they are not the only ones. If you want to complete the picture in your yard, then go for a variety, diversity, lots of different kinds of plants, colors, different colors, tall ones, short ones, sun, shade, grasses, herbs, flowers, all lots of different flowering plants. And that way you will appeal to a variety of insects that you wanna bring in. We have the lavender up here, many different kinds. We have parsley down here on the bottom, which has been allowed to go to flower. You can sort of keep one parsley plant without flowers to use in your kitchen and let some of them go to flower for the insect. That goes along, by the way, with many different herbs and plants. Salvia species, there are so many different salvias and they're beautiful and they're, and they're easy to grow. This one is meadow sage, but there are a lot of colors, a lot of plants, different types of plants. So keep an eye out for the salvias. <clears throat> On the top here, we have feverfew, which looks like a tiny, tiny little daisy and is also attractive, especially to the little native, the little parasitic wasps, the wasps that you do want to attract. Another one in that area would be the Santa Barbara daisy, which has flowers that look almost exactly the same. And they are a California native, whereas feverfew is not. Down on the bottom, you have flowering rosemary, which is when they're flowering, they are great as far as attracting bees and other pollinators. The last few here are some that you probably have in your yard or at least would like to. The sunflower on the left is, is wonderful at attracting uh, insects. Unfortunately, they're not all beneficials. They attract grasshoppers and they attract other things you might not necessarily want in your yard, but they are a great plant for attracting insects in general. And of course, when you bring grasshoppers in, the, the birds, the bluebirds love to eat them. So that's sort of, you can look at it that way as a source of food for the birds. And basil allowed to go to flower, oregano allowed to go to flower. It's a good idea. Now quickly, I'm gonna go through the commercial purchase and release of beneficials, the good things and the bad things. It sounds great, but be careful because it can be complicated depending on who you buy them from. Beneficials have been studied in large scale agricultural operations more than they have in home gardens. So they are very useful, but maybe not as much for you as for the great big guys down in, in the valley. Now quickly we'll go through the things you might need to watch out for. They can be expensive, depending on how big your garden is. That's a lot of money. You can receive insects containing parasites and therefore introduce them into your yard and your ecosystem. Not a great idea. You can have a danger of poor health in those insects causing early death. And that means you wasted your money. That could be induced by poor husbandry on the part of the people selling them or shipping conditions, or the time of year, or whatever. 
but you need to discuss this with whomever you're buying them from. And the poor health can cause the lack of reproductive capacity. And that's what you're buying them for, to help your garden in the future by reproducing and making more baby beneficial insects to help out. And so you don't need for them to start out sick. They can have a danger of early death caused by you messing up somehow and handling them improperly on your end because you need instructions from the people who are sending them to you so that you can do a good job. There is a danger in particular with ladybugs of early migration if those critters are harvested and handled improperly because if they just pick them up from one of those harvesting, those trees out in the forest where the ladybugs gather for their winter and they sell them to you, the first thing they're gonna do when you open a box and put them in your garden is they're gonna fly away because that's their, that's what nature is telling them to do, migrate, migrate. So you may be helping your neighbor's yard, but not your own. Lace wings are shipped as eggs often. And if they happen to hatch during shipment, they will start eating each other because they are cannibalistic. So you need to watch for that. And lace wing eggs, if you get them in your garden and they haven't hatched yet, which is great, they can be eaten by ants or other insects. And so they need to hatch quickly after you apply them. And so it's a, it's a timing thing and you have to be sure to try to get it right. So coming to the end here, we'd I'd like to point out to you that UC Davis has an actual IPM website. It's ipm.ucdavis.edu. You don't even have to type in the HTTP, WW, blah, blah, all of that, just IPM ucdavis.edu and this is what you will get and you want to click here home garden turf and landscape pest this is the best thing that's going to help you and once you do this is the page that you will open up and it, it has a huge amount of information a great way to learn about this topic and over on the right here where the arrow is pointing there is a thing you can click on called the Pest Notes Library, which has pages and pages describing each individual pest, their life cycle, and how to help you get rid of them if you need to. It's a wonderful thing. So do try this particular website. It's a great educational resource and one that we use all the time. Now, to end up here, I know that when you walk into the local stores, these are what you are faced with. Shelves and shelves and shelves of products. And you don't, you don't really know where to go, what to choose. It's, oh, it's a very difficult thing. So do your research and study. If you have questions, maybe give us a call or give us an email on the email site that uh, Lisa mentioned at the beginning of this talk on our website and we'll help you. We'll help you choose because this can be absolutely difficult to make a choice from and there's everyone is trying to tell sell you something. One thing that I want you to remember is don't forget what a baby ladybug looks like. That's what it is and I'm so grateful that all of you showed up today. Thank you very much. And that's the end. Thank you, Bonnie. I always learn so much. I do have some wonderful questions for you. Okay. Natasha has sent in a question about Tanglefoot. She said, thanks for advice and your advice regarding using terry cloth wrap with Tanglefoot. I used corrugated cardboard on my apple tree, but it still had many aphids and ants. Any reason to change over to terry cloth this year or should I just wait until next year? And thank you so much for your talk today. Natasha, the corrugated cardboard thing is actually a really good idea in a way because many people use that to, tr to trap insects underneath that the corrugations uh, there so that when you unwrap the corrugated cardboard, you can just toss it and a great many times, codling moths will actually be 
sitting underneath that cardboard in either pupil stage or young stage. So uh, that particular way of wrapping is sort of a good idea, but uh, there are the ants can get right through those tunnels. So I think probably I might go to wrapping the tree with with either the surgical tape or even an ace bandage or you know something that will be a little stretchy and will cling to the bark so that things can't crawl under it. Don't make it too tight and do take it off at the end of the season because you, you don't want to do damage to the bark. Was that all her question? I didn't. Uh, that, I believe that was it. And, okay. um, and you addressed it really well. It was interesting. I was thinking about, okay, cardboard, vet wrap, <laughs> surgical tape, you know, all of it. Just put it all <laughs> on the tree. Just joking. <laughs> okay, so I do have another question about Matilaha poppies. What do Matilaha poppies look like in winter? here in the foothills and do we cut them down then or in summer do they need anything like deadheading so it's just a little bit of horticultural notes about matilla yeah hop that's all great questions <laughs> matilla hop poppies pretty they they look terrible in the winter <laughs> they they start to it's just the way it is with this you know native plant they start to die off and turn yellow in the late summer, that's their that's the natural thing that happens, and and so yes, you should probably in maybe January or February cut them back. This year, I didn't do that with my own uh, Matilda hop poppy in my backyard. I was lazy and didn't have time, and I didn't cut it back, and so it's still fine. But it would look better if you cut it back, not all the way to the ground, but maybe leave a couple inches, six inches, five inches. And then next spring, they, it will grow all the way back to the huge size that it, it will always be. So don't worry about cutting it back. Cutting it back is a good thing. And as far as the flowers, no, you do not need to deadhead them. They will sort of deadhead themselves. And the flowers... They don't last forever. I mean, it's not a flowering plant that flowers, flowers all summer, but it does flower for at least a month or two. And fl one flower will die and another will open because a mature plant has hundreds of flower buds on it. So it will continue to flower. And then after the flowers are gone, it will produce lots and lots of seeds. Um, not that they will primarily sprout because they won't. It's primarily um, reproduces itself by underground rhizomes where it crawls under the ground and then comes up two or three feet away. And then again, and then again, and then again. But as far as the seeds go, if there's ever a wildfire in an area where they're growing, the, they, the seeds are activated by fire. And so they are one of the first plants that will come back after a fire. So the seeds aren't really a problem unless there's a fire. Good, I love knowing more about them. My mom has literally a forest of Matilda poppies in her yard. And I'll have <laughs> oh to take gosh. a picture. I mean, it's such a conversational piece for everyone, of course, but I'll take a picture for our newsletter. It, it, it's such a killer plant. It's a dramatic plant. Yeah, I want a big one in the demo garden. Okay, here's <laughs> another question about um, codling moths. Um, about the traps, do they work to protect apple trees from damage and, and how can I, it was about coddling moths, trapping them, and then if you could just address that. Right. Um, in, when the traps were first invented, and with, especially with the pheromone lure, then usually large apple, um, of course apple trees aren't the only thing that coddling moths hit, but walnuts also, uh, apple trees, growers will put say one or two traps in a tree just to keep track of when the coddling moths show up. And they have very intricate charts and, and ways to tell when they should start treating those trees in, with, in other ways, either with uh, pesticide treatment if they're not organic, uh, but or, or a, t a type of organic pesticides like 
it's been a sad or something if they want to treat the trees. They use those traps for monitoring numbers. However, if you only have one tree in your yard and you hang, this is sort of crazy, but if you hang like 10 traps in that tree, you are probably going to make a difference in how many coddling moths there are. But people that have huge orchards don't have enough money to buy 10 traps to put in every tree. So in general, the answer is no, they're probably not going to um, reduce, completely get rid of your coddling moth problem. Nothing will, <laughs> but you need to just do as many things as possible to do that. You can even wrap, they sell up at, at one of the local nurseries, they sell little stretchy bags that you can wrap around an apple to and sort of tie off at one end to prevent coddling moths from getting in because they they hatch and they immediately crawl inside an apple and that's where the worms are that's where they grow as everybody knows inside the apple so you can get those little bags if you want to do a little bit of work and wrap them around the apples in your trees <laughs> a and new service works. oh my goodness a new service for us here in the foothills we'll be calling up folks to little gnomes could do it <laughs> okay, I, I do have yes. a question about uh, how do you use the spray killer safer? You know, the one, the commercially one known. It's it says caterpillar killer on it, and will it kill bees? Caterpillar killer is a product that's main ingredient is Bacillus thuringiensis, which is better known as Bt, since most people don't know that word. And Bt is an extremely efficient killer of caterpillars, meaning the larva of moths or butterflies. But, and, and so no, they won't kill, it won't kill bees. But keep in mind, it also won't kill anything that's not a caterpillar. So if you have a worm crawling around eating whatever, something that you think that's a pest that's, that's bothering you, you better be sure it's a caterpillar before you spray BT on it. For example, there are little worms that are the offspring of sawflies. They will not be killed by BT, even though they may look like a caterpillar. So this is one of those reasons why you need to make sure which, what target species you're after before you figure out what to use to kill it. But BT is a fact, it's again, like spraying with water, you can't just do it once and walk away than once. You have to be sure to shake it to make sure that it's all mixed up before you spray. And they do have to eat it in order for it to kill them. So they may cause a little bit more damage to your, whatever your plant is after you spray before they die. Expect instantaneous death because that's not what happens. Okay. Okay. That was good. Informative all the way around. I do have a question about ornamentals, specifically roses and the scarab beetle and the other beetles that'll get on the blossoms. How much, I mean, do we just have tolerance for that? Are they really doing that much damage? Can you kind of give your opinion? Well, um, again, depending on the color of the roses, I have roses all over my yard which probably I shouldn't, but I do, and I love them. And the light colored roses are always a mess. They're a mess because the hoplia beetles crawl all over them before I can even get to them. And they decimate big holes, shredded, you know, so the rose plant may look okay, but the flowers are blah. So, I'm, but I'm not gonna spray that the heck out of, every one of those flowers to try to get, I pick the beetles off, I clip off the worst of damaged roses. And at some point I'm probably gonna remove them because white roses are really difficult to keep looking great. And then of course you have thrips and thrips are something that you might be able to, that of course the pirate bugs are probably gonna get your thrips for you. So you might wanna uh, let them alone. But you can also spray spinosad, which is an organic spray de uh, developed, um, not, a, not a chemical spray, but sort of like pyrethrin. It's not from a plant, it's not plant derived, but it's bacteria derived. 
and it does a pretty good job. And you could try doing that, but a lot of that damage for some of those roses is done while the roses are still buds. So the buds are all wrapped up and inside the bud where you can't even get there is the insects that are doing the damage. Interesting. And spinosad is S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D. <laughs> well, Bonnie, I think we're coming to the end of our questions. I don't have any new chats coming in and I could just listen okay. to your lectures day after day. They're just jam packed and I love it. Thank you so much. So be well and thank you, Bonnie. And yay. Right. Enjoy your day, everyone. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Gorgeous out there. Gorgeous.